Okay, let's see our Bibles this morning. Word. Oh, you guys are tired. Hey, spend a moment. To tell the person next to you you just love their, what they have on today. Let's see your Bibles this morning. Let's see your pens. Your lesson plan. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 4. In the I was in the airport the other day, standing in line watching these parents um, take care of their kids as we all waited an extra hour and a half for the flight that was late. And we were on Southwest, so they got you standing in these lines, and you don't want to lose your spot because you don't have a ticket. So you got to, you want to get a seat, you got to get there. So we're standing there, and these kids are running around doing what little kids do. And then right before we went on the plane, the mom went down the jetway to get the seat ready or do something, and the baby started crying. Mommy, mommy, he started freaking out. And the dad's like, Mommy went down the jetway to get the seat ready. She's with the stewardess to, trying to explain to this little kid what's happening. And I'm sitting on my mind going, that kid has no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and not only that, all she, your little kid knows is that Mommy is gone. Don't understand Jetway, don't understand students, don't understand getting something ready for me later on. All I know is right now, mommy is not here. And until mommy comes back, I'm raising hell up in this airport, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Reason being is that little children have very limited understanding of things we understand. And last week we talked about how little children will always put into context everything that happens to them in the context of themselves. In other words, if someone treats me bad, it's because of something I did, because they have very limited understanding that anyone else, else could have their own reason for their behavior, other than their own behavior. If it's about me, it must, if, it, if it affects me, it must be about me. If my dog runs away, it, it's probably because of something I did. If someone treats me bad, it's probably because of something I did or something I am, because they don't understand too much far beyond themselves. Now, when we grow up, we're supposed to grow out of that. And we're supposed to grow up to understand that people do things to us or be, uh, at us for other, re other reasons other than us. People have their own issues. Sometimes it has nothing to do with us. So when we grow up, we're supposed to get that perception. When God, when we're born again, we start that process all over again with God. In other words, God calls us to do things, and we automatically respond to his request based on all we know about us and our world. Now, we can expand that to us, meaning people we know, things we've seen done in the world, but even all the information that relates to all the things that is associated with our world is limited. In other words, if you took all the wisdom of the world and all the money of the world, all the resources of the world, and all the knowledge of the world, you still will come up short to be able to do what God calls you to do because it requires supernaturalness, only which you can get from God. So when God called Moses to go to Pharaoh, Moses automatically, like a little child, said, wait a minute, God, based on what I know, I can't do that. Who am I? Who are you? He had five excuses. So we're going to look at the last three today. Now, let's go back a little further. Let's look at our map and see, get a little history lesson on where Moses. Remember, he spent 40 years in the desert, I mean in Egypt. Then he went down to the desert, and there he is talking to the burning bush. We talked about talking fire. And then Moses get ready to hit the fire, then he realized it's God, and he changed his mind. That's in the next slide, but we're not going to look at that one. So we got Moses down there talking to fire. We also talked about a few weeks ago why the bush wasn't burning, because the fire was God himself, not natural fire like we know fire. It's a different kind of fire. But that's another story. If you want to get that message, it's on CD in the bookstore. But today we're going to look at the last three excuses. If you remember, the first excuse was, who am I? 
And Moses says, I'm not anybody. And God said in response, you belong to me. I will be with you. It's not about who you are. It's about whose you are. Okay. The next excuse Moses had was, who are you? When they asked me, God sent me, what's your name? And God said, I am that I am, Yahweh, Jehovah. Okay. I was always was. I am now. I always will be. So you have to pay attention not only to Moses' excuses, but more importantly, God's response. The reason the story is in the Bible, so we can learn God's response. Because we will always have the same excuses Moses had, but if you don't have the response, you'll just hold on to your excuse and do nothing. We have to focus on what God, how God responded. His third excuse, we're going to read in chapter 4, verse 1. Moses answered and said, But suppose... They will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, the Lord has not appeared to you. What if someone said to you, how do you, can you prove you have met with God? Last Sunday night, I walked out of here to go home, and there was a young lady standing right out there. And I could tell she was wanting to have a little fight with me. And uh, I walked down, and she came up to me, and she said, Two years ago, you told me I was going to go to hell. And you judged my heart, and she went on and started yelling at me, screaming at me. So I stood there and listened to her and let her talk, talk, talk. And then I said, okay, um, what did I really say? And then she went on to restate what she said was, I share with you my, what I believe about God and blah, blah. And I said, did this happen? Did you tell me that you didn't believe in Christ? and that you had your own philosophy, and you were going to go to heaven based on that? She said, yes. And I, ba and I basically said, if you don't have Christ, that uh, the, the Bible says that you're going to go to hell. Is that what I said? Oh, okay, yes, I did say that. But I didn't judge your heart. All I told you was a state of fact. In other words, either you are in the first grade, or you are not. It has nothing to do with your heart. Either you're part of this family, or you're not. It's just a fact of the matter. It has nothing to do with your intention. It has nothing to do with whether you're a good person or, 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 or a kind person or an evil person. It's just a statement of fact. And the fact is, if you haven't asked Christ to be your Savior, the Bible says you're not one of his children. That's what the Bible says. And the Bible says if you die without Christ, you're eternally damned into, into hell. That's all I said. I have a right to believe what I want to believe. You have a right to believe what you want to believe. But I was not judging your heart, your intention. So after we talked for 45 minutes... And she, you know, apologized. She actually wanted to pay me money because she kept, took up my time. I said, you don't have to pay me money. Just get saved. That's all I wanted to have. <laughs> but in this conversation, she says to me, how do you know God is real? How do you know? Now, without spending another three hours and giving her evidence, I simply share with her what this passage is going to tell us. Let's keep reading. It says, the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a rod. He said, cast to the ground. So he cast to the ground and became a snake. And Moses fled. And the Lord said, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. He reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord, your God, of the, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to you. Do this. Furthermore, the Lord said, put your hand in your bosom, in your jacket, on your chest. He put his hand in his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, it was leprous like snow. He said, put your hand back in your bosom. And Moses real quickly put his hand back in his bosom, <laughs> drew it out, and behold, it was restored like the other flesh. Then it will believe, believe if they do not believe you, nor heed the message of the first sign, that they may believe the message of the latter sign. And then he says, and it shall be if they do not believe even these two signs, or listen to your voice, you shall take water from the river, pour it on the dry land, and the water which you take from the river will become like blood on dry land. What did God say? Moses says, God, what if they say God didn't appear to you? What do I do? Show them power. Supernatural power. My question to you is, what is supernatural in your life? So you go to church. So you can quote a scripture. So you can say word. So you can wear a shirt that says, who's the man? Big deal. I'm not saying it's not important. I'm not saying that. But a whole lot of people go to church every week. A whole lot of people have Bibles in their homes. But how? what makes you different from the average Joe who knows nothing about God who goes to church? 
supernatural power. How do you know supernatural power is in your life? The most simple evidence of supernatural power in your life is the fact that your life has changed. You, your testimony. There was a guy in the Bible who was blind. Jesus healed him, and he started going around saying Jesus healed him. And the Pharisees and the scribes who hated Christ tried to uh, catch Christ in lies and, they actually, and they had him crucified. They said, who healed you? Jesus, Jesus. They said, you need to be quiet. That guy's a blasphemer. He's a heretic. He's an he's a evil uh, a devil worshiper. And the guy, the, bl the blind guy who now could see, you know what he says? He says, listen, I don't know anything about all that mess. I don't know what he said before. I don't know if he contradicted Moses. All I know, I was blind. Now I see. Now, I, are you, can you do that for me? Until you could do that for me, then I worship you. But all I know is that there was a time that I could not see, and now I see. What is supernatural in your life? This girl asked me, she said, how do you know? I said, listen, let me tell you something, girlfriend. I used to use cocaine. I stopped in one day. I used to hers. I wasn't a big drinker. All in one day, I stopped doing that, got back to my girlfriend, and we were married 20 years. That's all I know. Where I used to have not have joy all the time, now I have joy. Where I used to not have peace, now I have peace. Where I used to worry about people, uh, that I had to please someone to keep my job, or worried that my future was in the hands of a man, now I realize that's not true anymore. That's what I know. When I read this book, it speaks to me, it tells me stuff, and it happens. That's what I know. I can't get that anywhere else. Now, you may have a theory. Great. We all have theories. But let me tell you something. I know what God has done in my life. Do you know that? You have to ask that question because you can read the Bible all you want. You can have a whole bunch of theological concepts in your mind. But if there's no supernaturalness in your mind, what do you have? God is supernatural. When I, I went for, um, I have a Master's of Divinity. And when I applied, because I don't have an undergrad bachelor's degree, I had to take some classes and they applied some of my, of my ministry experience to the degree. And I had to go for an interview. So there were three PhDs, EDDs, all these DDDs guys, ADD brothers. And I said, <laughs> what's ironic is that if you have a master's degree, you can go up to someone with a PhD and you can say, I'll call you doctor, but you call me master and everything will be fine. <laughs> anyway, I was in this interview. And they said, well, Miles, uh, please tell us how the, the, the theological studies uh, at Azusa have helped you in your ministry. And I was like, I, I was a new student. I only had taken two classes. I didn't really know a whole lot. So I said, I started telling them these stories about God delivering gang members from, from, from stuff and people, uh, kids on drugs. I was doing youth ministry. I was all up in the neighborhood doing stuff. And God was doing all this amazing stuff. And they were like, whoa. And all the theological educational questions weren't asked anymore. It was so much about what God was doing. And that, my interview ended. I walked out. Whew. But it was about God. What is God doing in your life? If you don't know, when he asks you to do something supernatural, you're not going to have any reference point. You're not going to believe it's true. You're not going to believe it's possible. Because you have a job and live in a beautiful city and have a nice place to live and, you don't, and, and you're pretty happy, does not necessarily mean you're blessed of God. There are people who don't know God who have all that. This is true. You know, we were in a class once, and, and it was on Christian formation, spiritual maturity, spiritual development, all kind of the same thing. And, they, and the first day of the class, he put up a picture of a ghetto, of a neighborhood that is run down, not necessarily black, white, or Hispanic, just a run down neighborhood, and another neighborhood that was very well manicured, not necessarily white, black, or Hispanic. Which one's more Christian, he asked. Mm. we all step back. And you might think, well, the one that's more neat. Why do you say that? Because that's our worldview, not necessarily biblical. God has chosen poor to be rich in faith, the Bible says. But we have these images of what's godly. We have these images. No, no, no. What, what God says is Moses. You want to know how, what's evidence you know me? Is your power. Your power. And there's a whole lot of people who know Bible verses have no power. A whole lot of people go to church, have no power. There's a whole lot of people who call themselves clergy, have no power. They don't know God. They know about God. They don't know God himself. God is supernatural. When David killed Goliath, if you remember the story, if you don't know the story, I'll tell it to you. There was a hill. 
And on top of this ridge of a hill was all the Israelite army. There was a valley in the middle, another hill. On this ridge was a Philistine army. And 40 days straight, Goliath came out and talked trash, said, if any one of you Jew boys can kill me, we all Philistines will bow down. But if one of you guys kill one of our Philistine boys, we will bow down. Just one-on-one, mano y mano. 40 days, Goliath came out and talked trash. Nobody wanted to fight Goliath. Now, Goliath didn't know that 40 was the number of testing, so he didn't realize on the 40th day he was getting his behind whooped. He didn't realize that. So he came out saying, yeah, every day, who can come out with me? Who can come out with me? And nobody wanted to whoop him. All the Jewish army would run when they came out. <clears throat> One day David came out. Little boy, his brothers, older brothers was in the army. He heard Goliath talking. He came out to give his brothers some cheese and crackers because they didn't have any food. He went, he's giving them food. And he hears Goliath talking. And he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should talk against the, God, the, the armies of the living God? This is what he said. What, is, what do I get if I whoop him? Well, the king said he'll give you his daughter as his wife. He said, what else do I get? I don't like her. What else do I get? <laughs> he says, you can get tax exemption. This is true. This is true. So he said, okay, I'll go out and whoop him. And the king, he went into the king and said, look, king, I can whoop Goliath. He says, you ain't nothing but a little kid. Here's what Goliath, here's what David said. I used to keep sheep. And when someone came, when a bear or a lion came against a sheep, I would whoop the bear or lion. Matter of fact, one bear took one of my sheeps. I took, grabbed the, sheep, the, lion, the bear, opened his mouth, took out the sheeps, and walked away. And when the bear came after me, I put the sheeps down and killed the bear. He says, I have, the Lord has killed both lion and bear. He had that as a reference point. He says, because God delivered me from the lion and bear, he can deliver me from this fool. <laughs> what has God done in your life? What has he delivered you from? What has he filled your heart with? What has he revealed to you? What has he called you to? What is supernatural about your life? And the supernatural, supernaturalness of God is in your life every day. It's not like last year something happened. That may be all you remember, but it happens every day. He wants to be active in your life every day. Every time you're thinking about making a decision, every time you're struggling with something, he wants to be active in your life every day. His power. And so David went out and killed Goliath. Uh, um, and I won't get into this rest of the story. It's a great story. His first thing was, I am Mo Moses' first excuse. Uh, actually, number three, but the first one today. Moses feared being viewed incredible or not having credibility. So God empowered him. Therefore, we must apply God's strength. Ephesians 6.10 says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. You do not want to fight God's battles in your power. See, Moses was all about his power. God wants you to be about God's power. Little kids are about what I have, who I am, what did I do. God's no, God wants you to think about who he is. It's all about God, it ain't about you. Next one. Verse 10. Moses said to the Lord, O oh Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since have you spoken to your servant, but I am so, 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 slow of speech and so, 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 slow of tongue. Some people believe he stuttered. And the Lord said to him, Who has made the man's mouth? Who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Moses focused on his inabilities, so God enlightened him of his design. Therefore, we must appreciate God's design. Moses focused on the stuff he couldn't do, his inabilities, his shortcomings. God enlightened him, I created you. So you need to appreciate how I created you and appreciate the work I'm going to do through you even though you are flawed. Every single one of us in here is flawed. It is not rocket science to, acknowledge, to notice the flaw. How quickly we notice the flaws in other people. Amen? Appreciate it. How, no, how, how quick is it to say, oh, they have this issue, and they have this problem, and that person is not this. And they're not tall enough, and they're not uh, smart enough, and he says wrong words. How could he be a preacher? Or how could he be? Okay. As we used to say when we were a kid, you want to 
Uh, I won't say that, but uh, <laughs> we, we used to say to guys, we used to say to guys, do you want a medal or a chest to put it on? You know what I'm saying? You, 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 so, you could, so you figured something out. Big deal. For you to notice something about yourself or someone else that makes them uh, uh, incapable in their own strength to do what God's called them to do, that is a given for every human that has ever lived. You're a frail. You're a sinner. God is glorified when he can take an imperfect vessel, you and me, to do something supernatural. That is the foolishness of the gospel. Why would a perfect God, Jesus, die for sinners? That's the gospel. That's why it's foolish to the wise. Because the wise would say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would someone holy die for someone unholy? That doesn't make any sense. That's the foolishness of God. That's the love of God. Let me tell you something. People, it is true, sorry, there is a difference between something that is true and something that is truth. There's a difference between something that is true and something that is truth. I'm going to say it one more time. There is a difference between something that is true and something that is truth. It is true that people aspire to do things that they don't have the money to do. But it is not truth that they can't do it. It is true that people with limited education aspire to do things that their education cannot support. But it is not truth that they can't accomplish that. It is true that you don't have the ability in of yourself to do anything God has called you to do in the spiritual. But it is truth that God will use you if you trust him. It's a difference. So you could focus on what's true. Oh, yeah, okay, so they don't have enough money. You don't have enough money to do what God's called you to do. You don't have enough education to do what God's called you to do. You don't have enough experience. Well, that's true. But it is also true and a bigger truth that God has called you to that and God will empower you to do that and God will grow you into that. That's the truth you need to focus on. But too many times we focus on true things and we'll blow them out of proportion and claim those true things to be truth when they're not. Are you following me? And it is true that every single one of you, there's a whole list of reasons why you're not worthy to be called a Christian. It's a whole list. Matter of fact, there's more than you know. Has anyone ever come up to you and said something to you that you did to them and you never realized you did it to them? And, 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 and you didn't mean to do it to them? And you've been doing it to people for years and you never knew it? Why didn't God ever show that to you then? You know, if God showed us all our sin, we would die of depression. We would just realize that there's so much wrong with me. What can I ever do good for God? Look what God says in verse 11. God says, who has made the man's mouth? Who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, the blind? Have not I the Lord? You know what's amazing about we? Who are we to say what we can and cannot do? Because we don't even understand how we work. I have a little slide here. I'm going to show you how you hear. Now, I'm going to tell you something. There may be one person in here. I shouldn't say maybe. There's probably several people in here who understand the mechanism of hearing, but I bet you there's no one in here, and I don't know if anyone human even knows how this thing really works. Now, I, what happens when you hear a vibration from the air comes into your ear, and it hits the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane is your eardrum. My daughter had a surgery in her ear, and I asked the doctor, could I come in and see what he was going to do? So he let me, and I looked in, and your eardrum looks like cellophane. It's like a little clear thing. Matter of fact, when you go to the doctor, when they look in your ear, when they look in your eyes, and look in your throat, everything the doctor does to you, ask him, can you do to him? <laughs> Not everything, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Not everything. Depending on how much you want to learn, huh? you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm a very inquisitive kind of brother, so, uh, and I've had the same doctor for 22 years, so, you know, I, I've looked, you know when they look in your, in your ear? I've looked in the ear. You look in your eye? You know when they look in your eye and they do like that with the light? Ask to do that. What they're looking at are these blood vessels in your eye, and they're actually looking at an extension of your brain. Your eye is an extension of your brain. 
It is fascinating, and you can see the blood. You can see actually blood going through this little vessel. Bloop, 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 in your eye. It is fascinating. Ask your doctor. All they can do is say no. And if they say no, ask again. And they'll say, well, you know, well, you know, it's really good. Come on, doc. <laughs> Everyone say, come on, doc. Come on, doc. Yeah, and you got to come on, doc. Like, you know, I, I, yeah, me, me, you, I'm paying you money. Let me, let me see your eye. It's a vibration in the air. It goes through the canal. The ear has three parts. It's a tympanic membrane. And then it vibrates these three little bones, the malleus, the stapes, and what's the third one? In what? Incus is three little bones. So the, 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 the tympanic membrane, the little cellophane, moves from the vibration, which you hear now. It hits one bone, hits another bone, hits another bone. Then it goes into the inner ear. That's the middle ear, and it goes into another three sets of bones, the cochlea, and these bones have this spiral thing, has another little spiral tube inside of it, which has fluid inside and outside. That shakes, and it has little hairs that are tickled. I'm, I'm abbreviating a very long process. And little hairs, hit the next slide, little hairs move. They send an electrical impulse into your brain, and you hear. Now, that's a very simplified version of what really happens, but let me tell you something. How does it really make sound that we understand? And how do all those things happen for you to hear all those different sounds at the same time? Do anybody, does anyone know that? Just say no. It's like mind boggling. And God says, I'm going to design this thing. And who are you to tell me what you can and cannot do? Who are you going to see a movie coming out on Ray Charles' life? Ray Charles couldn't see with his eyes, but he could see. He could see. You don't think he saw songs? You don't think he saw emotion? And when you see the movie, you're going to see him sensing stuff around him that people who can see with their eyes couldn't sense. God says the limitations of your senses that you understand is not the limitation. Because with your eyes, you can see physical things, but with your heart, I could show you invisible things. With your ears, you can hear audible things, but with the ears I give you, you're going to hear stuff no one can hear. Elephants communicate over miles through the woods with subsonic groanings. Sounds like this. <laughs> you, I'll do it again. Sounds just like this. You and I can't hear it. They can hear it. 10, 15 miles through the woods, they communicate to each other. How? God says, don't limit what I can do through you to what you understand. Let me be God. Let me do what I can do. And so when you say, well, I can't, I can't, I can't, and people always say, you can't, you can't, you can't, or people always point, they can't, they can't, they can't. You're telling God what he can't do. You are projecting on God your disbelief. Don't do that. Say, God, I am honored. I am honored to be in a position that you would use me. And, and I'm not talking about me, myself. All of us should be saying this. I am honored to be, to, be, to, be, to be used to do something beyond what my abilities dictate. Beyond. And, and, and we are so quick to judge and determine someone's ability when we, don't, we can't even comprehend the ability of God. Amen? Look at the next one. says in verse 12, thir 12, verse 13. Oh, before I read this first, let me say this. Moses' first excuse, God, who am I? I'll be with you. God, who are you? I am that I am. God, what if they don't believe me? Throw that stick down. Whoosh, I'm a powerful God. God, I can't talk. I'll be with your mouth. His last excuse, because he ran out of them. I ain't going. No. You know, when people are faced with the opportunity to accept Christ as their Savior, every question they have, God has an answer. At some point, they either got to say yes or no. I choose to reject. If you choose to reject, then the only thing God can do is reject you because you rejected him. 
He said, if you're ashamed of him, he's going to be ashamed of you. But he gives everyone the opportunity. I've died for your sin. I'll forgive all your sin. I will bring you to heaven. I will give you peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness. Those are kind of the, the outgrowths of walking with me. I will show you your spiritual gifts. I will show you your eternal purpose. And I will transform your life. I died and rose from the dead. I'm the only one who's done that. So if you're, gonna, if you're looking for life, go to the one who has it. You can take all that facts, consider all those facts and say, I reject it. That's your opportunity. But if you reject it, there's a consequence. If you accept it, there's a consequence. But there's no neutral. You can't ignore it without consequence. You have to choose yes or no. So Moses heard all, he gave all his excuses. God gave all his answers, and they were either acceptable or unacceptable to Moses. So here's what Moses says in verse 13. He says, oh, my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. Any body but me. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron your brother the Levite? I know he can speak well. Look, he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and his mouth, and will teach you what you shall say. He said, Here comes Mo Aaron, your brother. Moses' last excuse, he expressed insubordination. So God equipped him with a partner. Therefore, we must secure assistance in our ministry or your walk with God. Secure assistance in your walk with God. Next one. Next slide. We're working on it. You did it? There you go. If there is ever something in your life you would like to become better at, I want you to think right now, just for one second, one area of your walk with God, one area in your professional life, in your Bible knowledge, your ability to obey God, just think of one area you say, you know what, I wish I could do this better. Let me tell you a foolproof way of getting that done. And by the way, pick the thing you've been procrastinating on for years. Do we all have something like that? Yeah. Years. Since you can remember having a memory, you've been procrastinating on it. Here's one way of, of, of overcoming that. Get one person in your life who's better at it than you and ask them to help you. Why do we help people? Pride. Just get one person. Anybody you can think of, by the way, this person has to be someone you are confident they love you and have your best interest in mind. Because people will voluntarily want to get in your business and in your life. <laughs> you know, I want to help you with this because sometimes they just want to lord their authority over you or, or, or be a judge to you or, you know, get you. You don't want those people. You are not obligated to those people. Not, not those kind of people. Someone who will partner with you in prayer to encourage you, to teach you. They're not going to talk behind your back. They're not going to talk about your junk. They are there to improve your relationship with God, your ability to obey. Do you have people like that in your life? Maybe you have a business. Do you have anybody who's better in business than you, mentoring you? Maybe you're, you're uh, in school. Other than your teacher, do you have someone tutoring you? You're a Christian. Do you have someone in your life who's a better Christian than you that's encouraging you in your walk with God? You're struggling with alcohol. You're struggling with sex. You're struggling with pornography. You're struggling with drinking, whatever it is. Do you have someone in your life that can hold you accountable? It's a very simple thing to get, and it doesn't have to be necessarily someone who's an expert. It could be just a friend who every week they're going to ask you a question. Like, did you look at pornography this week? You have to look them in the eye and answer. And you can't lie. And they have permission to ask you, are you lying? Did you get drink this week? Did you get angry this week? Did you get high this week? Did you tell a lie this week? Did you read your Bible every day this week? Did you pray every day? Whatever it is. Did you stand on one foot for five minutes? It doesn't matter. You can make it up. It's just this one thing I want someone to help me in, and I would encourage you to find somebody, ask God to send someone into your life, that they can just ask you a question. They can spend an hour a week with you, two hours a week, whatever it is. 
a couple weeks ago I talked about the guy who did Bible study with us or when I first got saved named Sherman. Actually, he was a coach last week. He was here in town. He was a coach with the uh, Tennessee Titans. And I got a chance to talk to him. We were just thinking back 22 years ago when he discipled me and two other guys when I was just learning what the Bible was. And now there's a church here because of the investment he made. Every day he saw us, he would jam us up. And we knew that when he gave us a verse to memorize, we knew the next day he was going to ask us. And we knew he was going to ask us in front of a whole bunch of people. Now, I'm not saying you have to do that. But that was his way. And it worked. And you have to be honest with those people. Get that person in your life. We, I have a group of people. There's three of them who are helping me in management leadership issues. We have about 50 people on staff. We are planning for growth up to about 200 people on staff. And if you're in management, you know there's a very different dynamic with 50 people than 200 people. So we are now planning and structuring the, the, the organizational structure for 200 or so people. What does that look like? And there's so many things to consider. I don't need to go into all those things. But there's so many things to consider that I don't know. These people know those things. So we have a written covenant that we signed how we're going to conduct our business, how we're going to relate to each other. We're going to be brutally honest with each other. We're not going to let stuff fester overnight. Blah, 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 blah. To outline our covenant to each other. To, to, and, and part of that is to be brutally honest with each other, which we are every time we meet. And we talk about all these issues with no egos involved. The only goal is to please God. That's it. That's it. And the first meeting, I had to break the ice and say, I, this is not about what I want. So if I want to make sure y'all have the full permission to put on the table what's best for the rock, not what's best for me. I, had to, I, I, I felt that I had to give them that permission just to make it all clear. This is about what does God want. Now, I also have in my life a preaching coach, a Bible coach, a health coach, a leadership development coach, a TV program coach, a pastoral coach, a real estate coach, and two legal coaches because that's all, you know, how that is. How to get extra. These are all people who have, all of them, more knowledge and information than I have that I'm saying, help me get better. I would challenge you to get start with one and look at every area of your life and just get one person. And you know, it's very simple. Diet person, just put a diet together and say, and have that person ask you every Friday or whatever it is, did you follow your diet? That's it. Because if you have that person, when you get ready to go sin, the little voice is going to say, uh, 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 you got to talk to Johnny on Monday. What you going to say? How you going to lie? You're like, man, I don't want you to be my accountability partner anymore. <laughs> you know what God did to get Moses over the hump? He sent him his brother. You know what get you over the hump? Get a partner. You're not alone. If you ever sit in a group of people, always remember this. One of you is never, never as smart as all of you. One of you is never as powerful as all of you. And if it's only one of you all the time, you are handicapped. You walk around with handcuffs on your feet and ankles. And if you're trying to do this Christian thing by yourself, <laughs> you're going to get beat down every day because the devil's good. And even if you're okay making it, you are never, ever as good as you can be if someone else was in your life. Never. It wasn't designed to be that way. That's why Christ offered to live in our heart. Christ didn't say, here are the rules. Go for it. And I'll be here when you're done. No, 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 no. Christ says, I want to come live in your heart. I want to be with you everywhere you go. Have you ever heard the term para church organization? Para means with. Paraclete is the Holy Spirit who is with us everywhere you go, alongside, in, around, back, and front. So Christ says, if you ask me to be your Savior, I am going to be with you 24-7, never leave you or forsake you. And by the way, I'm going to tell you things you don't know and show you things you've never seen. I'm going to empower you with power you never had. I'm going to, my presence is going to make you feel so secure and so valuable, even amidst your sinful nature, even amidst your flaws and your mistakes. 
that's, that's the nature of walking with God. And so every excuse Moses had, God says, that every excuse Moses had, all the answers are fulfilled in a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why it starts, continues, and ends with the relationship with Jesus Christ. Right now, I'm going to ask all of you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And just think for a minute. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you that our relationship with you is all we need. And Lord, there may be somebody here today who's saying, I need a relationship with Jesus Christ. I need him to forgive me and cleanse me. I need him to be with me 24-7. If that's you, just pray with me in the privacy of your heart. Pray, dear God, I believe I'm a sinner. I believe my sin is wrong and that it will kill me and send me to hell. Lord, I don't want to go to hell. I pray that you would forgive me right now and receive me as your child. If you prayed that prayer, just slip your hand up high. We can see you and pray for you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Good. God bless you. God bless you. Good. God bless you. Put your hands. Lord, we just pray for those people. And Lord, I want to pray for the people in here who have hearing problems. I know there's a, a group of people here who cannot hear, and they hear and receive the message through sign language. Lord, you are the one who formed the ear peri limp, endo limp, cochlea, stapes, bones, the tympanic membrane, and all the other parts of the hearing, the ear. Lord, I want to pray and agree as a church that you would heal the people here who have hearing problems. Lord, only you can do that, but we know you can. We pray you would restore their hearing in any way you see fit. But we believe that you are a God of miracles, and we believe that you say that we don't have because we don't ask. <laughs> so we are asking now and believing that you can heal. We pray you would touch our deaf brothers and sisters here this morning and touch their ears, that they may hear sounds they've never heard, and Lord, I pray for all of us that you would have us hear your voice like we've never heard before. That you would give us vision to see like we've never seen before. Tell us words of knowledge. Give us discernment of things we never knew existed. That you would take our natural senses and operate them in the spiritual, supernatural. And Lord, some of us have had a sense that that has already been happening because we sometimes know things we don't know how we know them we see visions we have ideas about the future and we don't know why i pray we would acknowledge that it's from you and allow you to unfold that story a little more that we may use those gifts and not live in the natural but in the supernatural thank you god for your faithfulness thank you Thank you for that little girl who spoke Hebrew to us today. Bless that little girl. With her little pigtails, whatever the things are called, coming out of her head. <laughs> Lord, I pray we could all be like a little child. And I pray we would not, that we would, as Moses questioned, we would be one who responds to your answers and trusts your answers. Thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing, there are going to be people up here who will pray for you. If you raise your hand or you want to come up to be touched for healing, you come up and maybe people will pray for you. And then we'll see you next week.